I, um, I would like to seize the opportunity to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to present a paper at this conference. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here and to introduce myself because I'm quite new to the field. I teach Biblical Hebrew and uh, Aramaic at Leo Beck College in London and my uh, research focuses on Aramaic dialectology and I also have a profound interest in Jewish mysticism. And today's talk beautifully combines those interests because I will be speaking about the Aramaic of the Zohar. Prior to Gershom Scholem's major trends, scholars already devoted attention to Zoharic Aramaic. Its dialect was thought to be uh, uh, related to uh, Aramaic writings that exhibited mixed dialectal features. And with mixed, uh, I mean uh, elements from uh, Palestinian Aramaic and Babylonian Aramaic, so Western and uh, Eastern features. For instance, the German theologian and Orientalist uh, Gustav Dahlmann, uh, he mentioned the Zohar in his grammar of Jewish-Palestinian Aramaic, and this grammar was published in 1894. Dalman listed the Zohar on the writings with a mixed dialect, also Targum to the Yonatan, uh, the fragmentary Targum, uh, the to, uh, Tosefta Targums to the Prophets, and the Aramaic Apocrypha. In particular, he noticed the strong dialectal similarities between the Zohar and the Targumim to the writings. He even went as far as to, as to describe the uh, dialect of the Targumim to the writings as Kunstprodukte, their language not being representative for the study of Aramaic as a living language. <coughs> According to Dalman, the Aramaic of the Targums to the writings and that of the Zohar uh, leans heavily on Palestinian Aramaic, especially uh, that of uh, Targums to the Yonathan and the Targums to the writings as a fragmentary Targum. However, it also <coughs> exhibits features from uh, uh, Babylonian Talmudic Aramaic. Interestingly, in 1929, Gershom Scholem adopted the view which was expressed by Gustav Dahlmann. And uh, jo uh, Gershom Scholem expressed this in his German Encyclopedia Judaica entry on the Aramaic language. However, by 1941, Gershom Scholem had revised his view on the nature of Zoharic Aramaic. In his work, Major Trends, he set out to demonstrate that the Zohar was composed in an artificial type of Aramaic in late 13th century Spain by Moshe de Leon. In order to give the Zohar authoritative status, de Leon not only attributed it to Rashbi, but he also tried to make it look authentic by, in, by employing various literary Aramaic dialects of antiquity, which resulted in a distinctive Zoharic Aramaic language. Sholem never uh, wrote a detailed study on this topic, but he presented a brief overview of, uh, on the linguistic peculiarities in his major trends on page 163. And you can uh, read with me on the screen the following. The Aramaic of the Zohar is a purely artificial affair, a literary language employed by a writer who obviously knew no other Aramaic than that of certain Jewish literary documents and who fashioned his own style in accordance with definite subjective criteria. According to Sholem, the underlying sources of this artificial idiom are the Babylonian Talmud and Targum Onkelos. The, the grammatical forms uh, uh, are those uh, found in Onkelos, but almost every line also contains a few features from Talmud Bafli. To further prove the artificiality of Zoharic Aramaic, Sholem briefly summed up a few linguistic misunderstandings and grammatical misconstructions. In many instances, the Leon confuses the P'al verbal, verbal stem with that of the Pa'el and the Af'el and vice versa. He employs entirely wrong verbs of the Itpa'el and also gives transitive meanings to the Itpa'el. His use of prepositions and conjunctions is pre preposterous. As for the vocabulary, 
Scholem noticed that the language is influenced by medieval Hebrew, Arabic, and Spanish. Moreover, De Leon seems to have sometimes misunderstood the meaning of expressions of his literary sources. De Leon frequently gives new meanings to ancient Aramaic words and comes up with entirely new words and phrases. Although Schulman's verdict on Soharic Aramaic as an artificial idiom was supported by only a few uh, number of examples, he, repeat, he repeated his view in his subsequent works and it became axiomatic for, so in Soharic scholarship. For instance, Scholem's verdict on Soharic Aramaic was reiterated by Menachem Kadari, one of his students. It was also adopted by Isaiah Tishki in his Wisdom of the Zohar. Scholem's verdict on Soharic Aramaic as an artificial language remained largely unchallenged. However, about 15 years ago, there was a wind of change. Mm -hmm. Charles Mopsik argued that the Aramaic was reclaimed by, uh, by the 13th century uh, Kabbalists. They used it as the language of speculation and revelation. This was in line with the use of Aramaic in earlier <coughs> mystical and mag magical writings. These Kabbalists recreated an idiom which was based exclusively on older literary models. However, Mopsik refused to call this type of Aramaic pseudo-Aramaic, because how could one then explain the fact that this type of Aramaic was understood by contemporaries and by subsequent generations? Mopsik argued that the Aramaic employed by the Kabbalists was an independent, independent idiolect in its own right. In several talks and publications, Yehuda Liebes also challenged Scholem's verdict on Zoharic Aramaic. Liebes argued that the language is completely natural. However, this does not mean that <laughs> Zoharic Aramaic is an organic development out of one single dialect. It rather absorbed elements from various sources. The esoteric nature of the Zohar made Aramaic the best vehicle for, advance, for advancing its mystical and doctrinal purposes, just like it had been for uh, earlier magical and mystical writings. In 2006, an article by Levis was published in English in the journal Aramaic Studies. In, in the article, the following was written, and you can read it on the screen. The Aramaic of the Zohar <coughs> represents a genuine linguistic need and is not merely camouflage employed to give the illusion of the time and place of Rabbi Simeon Bar Yochai. According to Liebes, Aramaic was still alive amongst the Spanish Jews in the Middle Ages as a written language. Liebes' tantalizing suggestion that the Zoharic language has a late Aramaic provenance was elaborated on in the years 2004 to 2009. In those years, a major research project was carried out uh, in the Department of Hebrew and Jewish Studies at University College London. The AH AHRC funded project was entitled Late Aramaic, the Literary and Linguistic Context of the Zohar. The project's principal in investigator was uh, Ada Rappaport Albert, and the project was carried out in close collaboration with Theodore Kwasman. The project challenged the prevalent scholarly opinion that Zoharic Aramaic was an artificially manufactured idiom. The project's aim was to demonstrate that the Aramaic of the Zoha was in fact a product of an unbroken literary tradition which still existed far into the Middle Ages. So the project did not regard the Aramaic of the Zohar as the vernacular of the Kabbalists. It was only used by them as a literary language. During the AHRC project, linguistic profiles uh, of various medieval sources were created and focusing uh, specifically on those for which no such linguistic profiles had uh, existed before. Uh, for instance, uh, we looked at the uh, liturgical poems from the Cairo Geniza. Uh, we looked at Aramaic fragments from uh, Tom Yeshu. Uh, 
The AHRC project concluded that this type of literary Aramaic, with its fusion of dialects, did in fact occur in medieval writings other than the Zohar. Some of the most distinctive flaws, um, uh, which Scholem had uh, uh, said that were characteristic for Zoharic Aramaic, were also found in these medieval Aramaic sources, both esoteric ones and non-esoteric ones. The AHRC project does successfully challenge Scholem's verdict on the language of the Zohar. My PhD research was embedded in this AHRC project. One of my tasks was to establish the dialect of the Targumic to Sefto to Ezekiel 1, verse 1. These two, these two Sefto Targums were of great interest to the project because they display long segments of unique mystical law that appears to be related to the Hegelot and Shirokoma traditions. Moreover, they seem to have circulated amongst late medieval Kabbalistic circles. In order to establish the dialect of these Tosefta Targums, I distinguished four linguistic categories, um, orthography, vocabulary, morphology, and syntax. My linguistic analysis revealed a fusion of dialects. These Tosefta Targums employ a language that basically basically belongs to that of Targum Onkelos and Targum Janven. This is the so-called JLA dialect. And JLA stands for Jewish Literary Aramaic. However, sometimes these Targums uh, um, uh, showed a dialectal mixture, which we also <laughs> find in Targum Sudu Janven and the Targum Sudu writings. And this is the so-called LJLA dialect. Late Jewish Literary Aramaic. And it's thought uh, that the, this type of Aramaic dialect developed after the 7th or 8th century. The LJLA dialect consists of Westernisms, Easternisms, Archaisms, Hebrewisms, loanwords, especially loanwords from uh, Greek. The LJLA dialect had been identified in the mid-1980s and uh, the early 1990s by Edward Cook and Stephen Kaufman. It seems these Targumic to Sefto to Ezekiel were composed in LJLA, even if they mimic JLA, because uh, that's one of the correct characteristics of LJLA. Uh, it seems that the language of Targum Onkelos and Targum Jonathan had a very high status because of its liturgical functions. And that's why the composers of the Tosefta Targums to Ezekiel seem to have aspired to use it. The AHRC project established that some of the most distinctive flaws of Zoharic Aramaic are also attested in other medieval Aramaic sources. When I examined, examined the language of the Tosefta Targums to Ezekiel, I discovered a few of the same grammatical mis misconstructions which Scholem had mentioned as being characteristic for Zoharic Aramaic. Scholem referred to the Zohar's apparent confusion between, uh, between uh, the meanings of the verb in the p al stem and those in the pa il and af il. However, these verbal stems can actually have the same meaning. The pa'il stem does not necessarily have to have an intensifying meaning, and the afil does not necessarily have to have a causative meaning. For instance, in the manuscripts, I found attestations of both the pa'al and the afil stems being used for the verb hadar, which means to go around, to encircle. The manuscripts also employed the pa'al and the afil interchangeably for the verb garaf, to destroy. I further discovered that the pa'il verb kavein, uh, meaning to turn, was used in the pa'al. And so far, I have never found attestation of the pa'al being used to convey this meaning. Scholem found further evidence of the Zohar's faulty Aramaic grammar in its distinctive use of the itpa'il forms. For instance, the author gives uh, transitive meanings to forms in the itpa'il. In Aramaic, the it by il and the it by al uh, verbal stems can indeed uh, well often have a reflexive or passive meaning. However, they sometimes can also have a transitive meaning. 
in my Josefta uh, Targums, I found an instance of the Itzbael of Shema, to listen, being used uh, in a transitive sense rather than in a normal passive sense. The AHRC project solely focused on the linguist linguistic trajectory towards Zoharic Aramaic, but it excluded examination of the Zoharic language itself. The findings of the project revealed nevertheless an urgent need for a revision of uh, Sholem's view. In the past few years, two pilot studies have been undertaken. Theodor Quasman examined in an article whether the, uh, some of the phonological, lexical and morph morphological features that are characteristic for Targum Sudiyonathan and Targum Sudi writings, whether they were also found in uh, uh, the Zohar. He concluded that the Zohar indeed seems to fit within the dialectal profile of these writings, the so-called LJLA dialect. Shortly after Kwasman's article, in November 2009, I presented a paper at the final conference of the AHRC project. In my paper, I presented the findings of uh, my brief examination of a Zoharic passage. I had carried out a linguistic analysis of a passage in Parashat Ruma. The passage discusses the influence of the stars on both the physical universe and human history. The slide's background, if you can see it, is actually an image of this passage in uh, manuscript Oxford uh, 2514. For my analysis, I adopted the same methodology which I had used for my PhD uh, research. Again, I distinguish four linguistic categories, um, orthography, vocabulary, morphology, and syntax, and I enlisted all the deviations from uh, the dialect of Onkelos and Jonathan, the JLA dialect. Interestingly, I noticed that many of these deviations in the Zoharic passage were also attested in the dialect of Targums to the Jonathan and Targums to the writings. I came across Westernisms, Easternisms, Archaisms, Hebrewisms, and identical morphological features. However, there were also noticeable differences. For instance, in the Soharic passage, the demonstrative adjective solely preceded the noun. For instance, um, Hahu Sitra, that site, Hahu comes before the noun. In JLA, however, in LJLA, however, it can either precede or follow the noun. To express the genitive construction, uh, LJLA prefers the construct states. The Soharic passage, on the other hand, preferred to use the relative pronoun. For instance, siuma de mashkana. De, the relative pronoun de is being used. The completion of the temple. Back then, I concluded that the intriguing dialectal mixture in this passage bears strong resemblance to LJLA, but there were also noticeable differences. So perhaps there are various dialectal branches in the literary Aramaic tradition of the Middle Ages. After these two pilot studies, it seems the time is right to carry out an extensive and systematic linguistic analysis, ana analysis of Zoharic Aramaic. The first step is to establish the linguistic profile of a representative Zoharic unit. After that, the dialectal position of this newly created linguistic profile can be located within the literary Aramaic tradition of the Middle Ages. For the first of task, I've chosen to create a linguistic profile of the Exodus Paracorp. The basis for my research will be the text edition, which has been recently be, be, been prepared by Ronit Moroz from Tel Aviv University. According to the textual analysis carried out by Ronit Moroz, the Exodus unit contains different layers running from the 11th century up to the 14th century. The text material therefore uh, provides a uh, fascinating and uh, excellent basis for this linguistic analysis. <laughs> 
Once I've created a linguistic profile of the Exodus Pericope, I shall establish in the second stage of my research its dialectal classification within the literary Aramaic tradition of the Middle Ages. In fairness to Sholem and his students, I would like to stress that in their time, the knowledge of Aramaic dialectology had, was actually rather limited. Groundbreaking discoveries such as the Dead Sea Scrolls and Targum Neophyti had not yet been made. The output of my research will be a monograph that clarifies the linguistic profile and dialectal classification of Paracon Exodus. The only grammar of, so, uh, of the Zohar ever published was written by, Nachem, by Menachem Kadari. Kadari's grammar dates from 1971, but uh, um, uh, it's based on his doctoral dissertation from 1956. Kadari's grammar is a great achievement, especially when one realizes that he wrote it as a PhD dissertation. How, however, nowadays, Kadari's grammar is slightly outdated for several reasons. It adopts Sholem's untenable description of Zoharic Aramaic as artificial. It is based on flawed printed editions. It does not discuss the Zoharic language in its literary and linguistic context. And neither does it include the hugely significant recent developments in both Aramaic dialectology and the textual research of Saharic uh, literature. <laughs> it is my hope that this, new grammar, that this new grammar will become a very useful study tool. I can't wait to get started. <laughs>